Hey everybody, Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist for 23 years at Adobe teaching photography and design. I'm teaching Photoshop on the iPad, what you can do with it, tips and tricks, how to work with layered files, how to save your files back and forth between desktop and mobile, as well as Photoshop and Lightroom, which one to use for which purposes. I hope that I teach you something, you get inspired, and that you leave here learning more than you came in with. And with that said, I can't wait to see what you do. Catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adobe Max, and this is our first uh, class on Introduction to Photoshop on the iPad. My name is Terry White, and I'm your instructor for the class, but I need help. <laughs> so <laughs> I brought Emily. Uh, Emily, as you probably saw her, she was the one that did the keynote yesterday. She did the Photoshop on the iPad on the keynote. And we're both together going to give you as much information about Photoshop on the iPad as we possibly can because I know Photoshop and she knows Photoshop on the iPad inside and out. She's studied it for like a year or two, two, two years. <laughs> yeah. And you're on the engineering team, right? Yeah, so I work, yeah, I work on the engineering team of Photoshop. Oh, the if there's, there's a feature you want. Tell me. <laughs> She's the one that can actually get it in. We're working on a lot of them. So. Yeah. All right, so with that said, we're going to just kind of bounce back and forth and give you um, tips, tricks, what you can do, what you will be able to do hopefully soon. And uh, if you could, they're recording this one, so if you can hold your questions to the end, we'll certainly save some time for questions. Um, and probably if you're about to ask a question now, you if you had just waited a few minutes, you would have seen it anyway. So let's hold off the questions till the end, and uh, we'll certainly do our best to save time for questions. All right, so I think I'm going to go first. I'm going to kick things off. Um, we're just going to just start giving you a look of the interface. Um, Emily's got a ton of little tips that, like, she's showing me left and right. I'm like, I didn't, wait, where'd you get that? How do you do that? Uh, and then we'll go from there. All right, so Photoshop on the iPad. I'm going to go to my Adobe folder. And this is where I keep all my Adobe apps. And let's go ahead and launch Photoshop. And so the first thing right off the bat is that Photoshop uses a new technology that we just introduced at this Max called Cloud Docs. So if you open an image, whether no matter where you get that image from, and start working on that image and just close Photoshop, it's syncing that image to the cloud. And that is the way that Photoshop talks to Photoshop on the desktop. So if you wanted to start something in either place, on the desktop or the iPad, and go back and forth, it is using Cloud Docs. Now, so the first question that people usually have in their mind is, oh my god, I have to keep all my images in the cloud. No, you don't. You can work with Cloud Docs. You don't have to work with Cloud Docs. But for the Photoshop on the iPad, Cloud Docs is the default. That is where it's going to save if you don't do anything else. Um, and on the desktop, now there's a new way to open images like you always did on your hard drive or open them from the Cloud Docs. So you'll see the ones that you created on your iPad when you go to Photoshop on the desktop. All right, so I've got Photoshop open on the uh, iPad right now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a new scene from scratch. Let's go ahead and do a, so I have two choices. Um, the one that Emily did yesterday during the keynote, she just did a create new, which brings up the standard new dialog box that you have seen in Photoshop for years. So uh, print sizes, screen sizes, film and video, and recent sizes, or of course, if none of those presets fit your fancy, you can always go over to the right-hand side and just start creating a document whatever size you want and start working on it. All right, so I'm not going to do it from scratch. I'm actually going to do the second choice at the bottom, which is import and open. When I go to import and open, I get three choices. Get an image from my camera roll, so that means an image that's actually on this iPad. Get an image from the files system, which is in iOS, and that means it could be anywhere. It could be on the iPad, it could be in Dropbox, it could be in Creative Cloud, it could be in any, any app that uses the file system. So I, um, I use Dropbox and Creative Cloud mostly, but there are several of my apps work with files on iOS. So wherever that image is, I can get it. And of course, if you want to hold your iPad up and be weird, you can take a picture with it 
<laughs> and use that as the camera to bring it in. And if you do that, I didn't mean to call you weird, but you are. All right, so let's go ahead and go to files. Um, so when I go to files, it's taking me to the last place I was, which if I were to back out of this, I have a folder called um, Photoshop on the iPad with different folders in it. If I go out, there's, it's in my demo folder, it's in my Creative Cloud folder, and if I go to locations, that's where it shows me all those different apps that support cloud, or I'm sorry, support files. Uh, so I'm gonna go to Creative Cloud. They're gonna make me drill down and find it again. I'm gonna go to demo. And I'm gonna go to, uh, I think I called it Photoshop on the iPad. Yep, PS on the iPad. And then the one I'm working with first is Live on the Moon. Okay, so this is just a bunch of images I put together for this class that I could just you know, start working with and playing with and, and doing things with. And I'm just gonna create kind of like a, 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 what do you call them, fantasy scene? A uh, fantasy scene with just you know, unrealistic things that people do in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and uh, start out with the home image. And that opened it up. Now, so that if it hadn't been local on my machine, that means in that case I did need an internet connection long enough for it to download the image. Now at this point, if I disconnect it from the internet or disconnect from Wi-Fi, I still have this image and I can work all I want. So you only need the internet connection when you're doing file in and out. So when I'm saving, or when I'm bringing an image down, if it's not local on this machine. Okay, so now I've got this image open, and the next thing I wanna do is I want to import a sky. Um, so now that uh, that whole window is gone, how do I bring in new images? How do I bring in additional images on top of this one? And, and even before we do that, let's talk about the, um, the interface. So on the left hand, you know, typical, typical Adobe app. On the left hand side, tools. On the right hand side, panels. And uh, you see the very little square in the middle on the right hand side, that is where the layer is. Now uh, that threw me at first, the very first time I saw Photoshop on the iPad, I was like, oh my god, I can't live with that little square as, as my layers panel. That's got to go. And it's really just designed that way to con conserve space. So if you want to see the full, what you're used to layers panel, just pinch it. So, or is that reverse pinch? That's pinch, so reverse pinch it. So reverse pinch it, and there we go. And that will expand it out to the full layers panel. And on- You can also use the buttons. Their button. Oh yeah, the button's on the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talked about yesterday that I always forget about. All right, so what she's- You're jumping right into this, the pro tricks. <laughs> this, this is why she's here. All right, so on the right hand side in the upper right hand corner, you notice that the top little layer stack is the one that's kind of highlighted because that's the one we're looking at now. I guess it would be this one. Mm -hmm. There's a button, so if the pinching, the reverse pinching is too hard, just tap the button. Yeah, with, one, with one layer, it can yeah. be difficult. And it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bailing me out there. All right, so anyway, you can go back and forth between those. All right, and then uh, the other button, like for example, the next one, the third one down, is then what you would do uh, these are the layer properties. So if you want to reduce the opacity, you want to add a blending mode, you want to go into the effects, smart filters, or dimensions of it, you can do all of those things, in, including adding a clip adjustment. We're going to get into all that in just a minute. Just pointing things out at this point. The fourth button down, which is just a plus sign, that's add a new layer. So if you just want an empty blank layer, you would just tap that one. Then you've got show and hide. So I can just hide the layer, show the layer. You've got add a layer mask to the layer. So that completely masks it out. You've got undo and redo. It's unlimited, right? Uh, I think it has the same restrictions as the default on desktop. It's unlimited. Ah. All right, so you, can, you, have, you have a bunch of undos and a bunch of redos at the top. Um, mask icon, I showed that. And then you've got the, that's the clip adjustment, right? This one? Clip or clip that's layer. the clip layer, right? And then uh, you have a filter button, which right now there's one great filter in there, Gaussian blur, more to, <laughs> more to come. Um, and then you have a menu. And the menu is where you get to a bunch of other little things that you would usually wanna do from the file or edit or the other menus that would normally be at the top, which we don't have. Now, um, during the keynote is actually where I learned a quick tip that Emily showed, and I love this, or like I was doing this to, you know, pinching and zooming with two fingers or uh, reverse pinching. 
to um, zoom my image. But one thing that she showed in the keynote, which is a tip that I use more now, is at the very top where it shows you the percentage, like right now I'm at 44%, that's scrubbable. So you can just take your finger and scrub that left or right to zoom in quickly and easily. So I, like, I actually like that better. I just seem to have more control when I do it that way. All right, the one big thing that I haven't mentioned yet, let me zoom down a little bit or move this over so you can see it, is that little, that kind of like finger-sized circle on the bottom left. That is your touch modifier. Shortcut. Touch shortcut, touch modifier. And think of that as if you were working in Photoshop on the desktop, a lot of things require you to hold down an option key or a shift key when you use that function. And since you could use, I am using this with a keyboard, but you could use it without a keyboard, that becomes that modifier. So if, if a tool has extra options and you want to, for example, let's say you're doing a selection and normally you would hold down the option key to um, subtract from that selection, you'd hold down that modifier instead. Now that modifier has two modes. Let me see if I can get to it. When I hold it down, notice that I'm swiping it a little to the upper left or any, in any direction. That makes the circle from a, a small circle to a bigger circle. So depending on the tool, it could have two options. So that's why, like on, on the desktop, you might hold an option sometimes. You might hold a shift sometimes. Depending on the tool, it might just be hold it down or um, I don't know. Scrub, scrub it over to get to the second set of options. And it will be tool dependent. So every tool is different. Um, so for example, I'm on quick select right now. And when I'm just holding the circle down, it's saying subtract from selection. When I swipe up, it switches to normal quick select. So it's like letting me toggle back and forth. But if I were to go to like the lasso and hold it down, it's add to the selection or just use the lasso. Move is, Move is the one that's got the best one. Okay, so I'll hold it down. Duplicate versus just move constrained. So you know like when you're using the move tool and you want to move something but you don't want it to go up or down, you hold down your shift key and you move it and it stays in a straight line. That's constrained. But in this case, the modifier, if you swipe or scrub over and you move, it will duplicate instead. So again, that's a great example where the tool can have two different options for that touch modifier. All right, and then last but not least, in desktop Photoshop, you'd have a control panel at the top. So when you select a tool, all those tool options would be at the top. That's at the bottom. So when I'm on the move tool, I see the options for the move tool at the very bottom of the screen. When I'm on- well, Actually, that's the selection toolbar, sorry. <laughs> well, it depends too. It, it um, will change based on what you're or is so it the, only selection? The bottom bar is just selections. You didn't notice, I think, but when you tried to pinch to zoom, you made a selection. So ah. if you see that bottom bar, it means you have an active selection, which no. I actually really like because sometimes you do have an active yeah. selection without realizing it. Um, and the, yeah, the tool options will present as that floating panel, which you can also then... Ah, uh, okay. Sidebar. All right. So I'm mis-explaining that. So this is your options. And if you have a selection like that, then the selection bar is at the bottom. Thank you. No. <laughs> Just keeping me this honest. Why I'm here. <laughs> now, notice that I made a selection real quick, and I got the deselect as the first choice at the bottom. I never, in desktop Photoshop, go up to a menu and choose deselect. I also, years ago, got away from trying to click away from a selection, because that's just bad in Photoshop. The easiest way to, make, to deselect in Photoshop on the desktop is Command-D or Control-D on Windows. Well, I have a keyboard attached to my iPad right now, and I just instinctively hit Command-D and deselect it. So a lot of your same desktop keyboard shortcuts will work on the iPad, but how do you know which ones? Hold down the Command key for a few seconds on the keyboard, and you'll see them. That'll show you all your keyboard shortcuts that you have ac option or access to. And you can swipe left and right because there's a bunch. So it won't pop up right away. You gotta hold the command key down for like three seconds before this will pop up. And that is and that is also contextual. So um, 
yeah, don't look at those and think, oh, that's all the that's options it. in the world. Because yeah. if you have, you know, if you make a selection and then hold that back down, you'll see now you s you'll see Command D as an option, whereas before it was what the reselect one is. Sweet. So it's showing you your available keyboard shortcuts in context. Exactly, in that moment. What's going on in that moment. Is there Got anyone it. here from Apple? Okay, good. <laughs> so I can say this. Something you might be wondering is why all my shift shortcuts, like why don't they work? Why can't you just wire those up? The answer is a hardware issue um, that the shift key on the Apple keyboard, on the iPad keyboard, doesn't actually transmit any data to the iPad. So we're working with Apple to fix that. Hopefully either a future generation of iOS or the keyboard itself will allow that interaction to happen. But And do we know if that's just this keyboard or any Bluetooth keyboard? I I don't know actually. I think it's any. Okay. It, yeah. I'd be curious to try that. Definitely one. the one that ever. It's definitely that. yeah the, the 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 fold over keyboard that comes with the iPad Pro. That's another question. So um, I know there was discussion you and I had back and forth uh, for the last few months on now that now that Photoshop for the iPad is shipped, what iPads does it work on? Oh Terry. There's a whole list. <laughs> oh, okay. While you look that up, I'm going to continue. I'll look it up. <laughs> so it's not just iPad Pros, right? No, it's um, okay. some more recent generations. And that's the point I, was, I wanted to make. Yeah. So people look at this and think, oh, I don't have an iPad Pro. I can't use it. There are, it doesn't just require an iPad Pro. There are other iPads that it works with. All right, so I'm going to deselect, and now I'm going to go finish working on this composite. All right, so now, um, and I left off before I went through the tour around the interface, how do I bring in my next image since that new open file thing is gone? Well, there's an actual button for it. Now, in, in desktop Photoshop, you go file import or file place to, to grab new images. Well, there's an actual button and the, below the text tool that looks like an image. Just tap it, and that will give you the same options. From the camera roll, well, actually, one more option. From the camera roll, from the files, which is where I was getting mine from, and one more, libraries, because you already have an image open. So just like Photoshop on a desktop, you can't start with a library item, but once you have an image open or a blank canvas, you can bring in library items. Same thing in uh, Photoshop on the iPad. All right, so I'm going to go back to files. I'm going to bring in my sky. And my sky is there. And it, it brings it in, just like on the desktop, in a free transform method. So I can now get it positioned where I want it, get it the size that I want it, do everything I want to do to it while I've got it here. So I'm just pinching it to make it bigger. I'm not having to hold down the shift key that doesn't transmit anything anyway. It's just doing it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so it is. Now, would I hold down the modifier if I wanted to stretch it? Yeah. OK, so the modifier becomes that shift operation. If you wanted to stretch it and not scale it proportionally, you need to hold down that touch modifier. OK. Um, now that I got it in place, and you can see that it's given me that second layer, I can go in and I can start playing with blending modes to see how I want to blend that in. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to the um, layer properties. And I have my blend modes. And my first bit of feedback for the Photoshop on the iPad team is either A, display what my actual layer is, yeah. or B, <laughs> take away these icons. Okay. Now, that's just me. Uh, the icons to me don't mean anything because they're not representative of my image. So either show me my image in the previews or don't show, just show me the words. I think that's the hope longitudinally. But to um, defend the inclusion, <laughs> <laughs> we, as, as I talked about yesterday, we, our first, um, you know, the first person we have in mind when we build this is obviously the creative professional who's using Photoshop every day. But we're, we really want to be thinking about how can we bring new users in? How can we actually sort of take some of these concepts and, and vocabulary that are not necessarily intuitive to someone who's never worked in a dark room? Yeah. Um, and this is like the, I, I the get bare it. minimum we can I get it for a beginner. It, it can it. help because, oh, I see the image gets darker. Let me yeah. use that. Let me start there. OK, I get it. but. I think we want the, yeah. Show me my preview. The full preview. Yeah, okay. See, she, I can take it, but I can also give it back. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so now I got this in place. Um, I'm lo loving what it's doing to the sky. I'm not loving what it's doing to the ground because you wouldn't have stars on the ground and there's no water so they wouldn't be reflecting on the dirt. So in this case, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to do a crop because I really don't need the ground anyway for this. So I'm gonna grab the crop tool and the crop tool looks like it is doing a constraint. No, let me see. No, it's not, okay. Oh, it's cropping, I see, it's cropping to the actual original image, not the sky. I'll bring it up to about there. Okay, um, done. All right, next up. Um, I still, you know, uh, I'm not crazy about some of the places where the stars are, are going, like on the rooftop. Um, now, in this case, I can add a mask, and I can start using my brush and painting that mask to mask off that top layer. But the problem is, the minute I do that, then that roof gets the original lightness that it originally had. So it's just as bright, just as daylight bright as it was from the very beginning. But that's okay, I'm gonna fix that in just a minute. So I'm gonna say, don't give me any stars on the actual house. Now this is pressure sensitive and I've got a fairly large brush. Let's go down the brush size. There we go. And one of the first things I discovered was, of course, when you're masking, black hides, white reveals. I was like, oh, I know on the desktop, I just hit the letter X and switch. And before I even got to, I didn't even think I had the keyboard attached at the time. I just like, well, how would I switch? And I just came over here and I just, Swiped it down, and it switched perfectly. I was like, oh, cool, I keep working. I love it when it's intuitive. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, yes, X does work if you do have the keyboard attached. And of course, I can pinch and zoom and do a better job with this. All right. All right, I'm not gonna be spend time being that picky because we don't have a lot of time today. But let's just go up, oh, let's go ahead and do some more of this. And here, here, and here. Just trying to take some of that sky off the building. Okay, um, zoom out. Okay, so now uh, my building's unnaturally bright. So I can go back to that layer that was below, and I can do what's called a clipped adjustment. In this case, I don't really need a clipped adjustment because it's, there's no other layer below it, but if there were a stack of layers, you typically would do a clipped adjustment when you only want the adjustment to affect the layer below. But just to show you what a clipped adjustment looks like, I can go in and I can go say, add a clipped adjustment. It brings up my adjustment layers, and I can go into um, something like exposure, and I can go in and adjust the exposure. Uh, it's adjusting the exposure overall. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring the exposure down. And let's see if I can do something with that mask. Actually, let me think about this. How do I wanna do this? Let's, let, hang on, let's do this. So I inverted the mask, and now I can go in on that mask and paint. I just did Command I, by the way. You could also load your previous mask. True. As a selection. Why am I painting in black? I thought I was on the mask. I'm on the mask. That's just super dark, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's we'll lighten that back up in just a minute. All right, there we go. So there we go. Just wanted it a little darker than it was super bright. Okay.
All right, next up. I'm going to go ahead and do another import. And import uh, from files. My moonshot. Oops, hang on, cancel. I'm going to import that above that layer. So let's do it again. There we go. And so now, this is one of the things, and, and um, you saw a sneak yesterday of uh, select subject and refine edge. Those aren't here today, but they're very soon, right? Soon. So anyway, I have to think, I have to go back in time and think of some of the ways I would have done this in the past to make the selection. Now, luckily, there is quick select. So I use quick select quite a bit. Select subject, I'm so spoiled by that because I just would have done it in one click. But in this case, I will go in. Oh, let's go ahead and lock it in. I will go in and switch to quick select and just start dragging my selection around. And quick select does do it. Now, in this point, I want to invert, the, invert that selection so that when I mask it, it masks the actual background. So I'm going to hit invert and then hit mask. Oh, and I did the opposite. Hang on. <laughs> I had it the right way. There we go. Invert and mask. All right, so now that I got that masked, um, before I size it down and move it in place and apply an adjustment to it, I want to cut it out. I want to actually hide the middle part of it. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go in and use the elliptical marquee. And this is where my touch modifier is going to come in. So I have that tool selected. And right now, if I make a selection, it says select constrain. If I select up, it says select constrain from the center. So you know how you hold down the option key when you want to make a selection from the center? That's what this is doing now. So that was just me holding the touch modifier down and swiping out to the outer edge. And now if I do it from roughly the center, it will make that selection from the center like I'm used to. And of course, I didn't get it quite in the center, but that's close enough. All right, so now I can move that where I really want it to be. Just going to be right about there. There we go. And now that I made that selection, I'm going to go ahead and I want to mask that too. So I'm going to fill that. Can I use the paint bucket on a mask? Yeah. Cool. There we go. So basically all I did was just fill that mask with black. All right, let's deselect. I still see some of the outer edge there. All right, so now I want to size it down. So again, I got to start thinking, how would I do that in a touch environment? There's a whole free transform mode so that there's a button for it. Just like you would hit Command-T on the Mac, uh, you have a free transform mode here. So I can scale it, rotate it, uh, flip it. And by the way, your flip controls are in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you have distort, perspective. Those things are on the left-hand side on the toolbar and the options. And of course, I can put that then wherever I want it to be. I want it up more over here. Okay, next up, uh, we're going to add one more image. Time. Okay, files. Well, actually, two more, but let's get this one in first. Uh, my ladder, same thing. Get it in place first. Um, make my selection. I'm just going now. This is one of my favorites. I'm just going to make a little bit of a selection on the white. So I'm just going to use quick select, and just a, just a touch of white got selected. I just moved it a little bit. Because at the very bottom, with all the selection options, there's a more option. And when I tap on more, it gives me select similar, which is key and crucial <laughs> in this case. Select similar, basically select all the white. And now I can go ahead and mask. <laughs> I always do the opposite, invert first and mask. There we go. Invert, mask, there we go. All right, um, one day that will lock in my brain as to which one's which. 
All right, so now let's go ahead and uh, free transform that one as well. Scale it down. Put it where I want it to be. Now this is another opportunity for, uh, by the way, and when you're in this compressed or condensed layer mode, you can swipe left to right to get between the layer and the mask. So right now I'm on the layer, if I swipe to the left, I'm on the mask and vice versa. Now that I'm on that layer, and I can still see a little bit of white left over, let's go ahead and mask that real quick. Okay, now that I'm on that layer, uh, this is another opportunity for a clipped adjustment. So I just go in, add a clipped adjustment, and in this case, I want to do, or I could do a, um, I will do a clipped adjustment. Uh, just again, want to bring down the exposure of that because it's a bit too bright. All right, next up, what are you climbing up to the moon to get to? <laughs> Let's give you your humble abode. All right, I, don't, I only need one thing in this. I only need the house. I don't need the, the sky, I don't need the ground, I don't need anything else. So let's go ahead and do one more. Select subject, I'm sorry, not select subject. <laughs> um, quick, quick select. Get just that. Now, one thing I haven't thought about is I have not tried. Let me see. Never mind. I don't see it as an option. We'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. Do I want to invert to do the mask? No. Yes. All right, so now we'll go ahead, and there's a little bit of white left in that window for a sky. So again, we're on the mask already. Go to the brush, size the brush down. And we're painting with black already. Just paint through to the sky. Now, had I made a better selection in the first place, then I wouldn't be dealing with this now. <laughs> so it's all about where do you want to do the work, up front or after? And I'm going to spend a lot of time cleaning this up, but you get the idea. Yeah, you can keep so Okay. Clean enough for now. And if we transform it, now the very first demo I ever did of of um, back then we called it the code name was Rocket, but the very first demo I ever did of Photoshop on the iPad was for an internal meeting, and I was working on an image, and I got to the point to where I wanted to move a layer. And I just clicked it and, or tapped it and, and dragged it and nothing happened. And, and it didn't happen after the second time. They're just like, oh, it's a, you know, it's a beta, it's a bug, it, it'll get fixed. And then I realized after I got off stage is that it, it was working. I just wasn't patient enough. When you want to move a layer, you actually hold it down for a second and then you can move it. If you start dragging it right away, nothing will happen. So, okay, I wanted to put it behind the moon. And then move it down just a bit. There we go. All right. And those are just, um, again, getting your feet wet on some of the things that you can begin to start working on in Photoshop on the iPad. Now, again, if I go home, if I just say, oh, I'm done for now, I'll come back later, tap on home, that will, once I have an internet connection, that will start the syncing process. Um, I think it starts syncing before then, right? Or does it wait till you're finished? Um, it's, it saves, there's like a specific cadence on which it saves and syncs. Gotcha. So even when you're working in the document, 
it should start. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It starts sinking yeah. even before you are, because in that case, in case it crashed or whatever. It's, yeah, it's saving locally a little more frequently than it's trying to sink all the way right. back. So if I go back to the desktop and I say open cloud docs, there it is. So it's already in the cloud. It's already accessible to me on my computer. So I can just go ahead and open it here. Now it's downloading it. And it's, it's been really cool, even preparing for this demo, yeah. you know, we use these assets, it's creative work just to get them to the point where we can use them in the demo keynote. Um, and that was a really cool chance to be going back and forth between the desktop and the iPad uh, and see, <laughs> wow, <laughs> um, and sort of like, just realize that there are things that, even if I'm sitting at my desk with my laptop, they're just things that are easier to do on the iPad. Yeah. And like I'd be bouncing over there for anything involving brushing, anything you know, like cloning or, or really fine grain selection. Because if you don't have like a Cintiq with you, um, yeah, that, it's just so much more fun to do it. <laughs> right, and also keep in mind it's not just one way. If I yeah. save a document that I want to play with on the iPad, that maybe it's got 50% or 75% of the work done, but I want to be able to brush, I want to be able to retouch, I want to be able to do things with my Apple Pencil, I can just go into Photoshop on the desktop, do a save as, and save it as a cloud document, and then it's ready for me to open on my iPad. So it will show up on the home screen of the iPad. All right, Emily, your turn. Want to show okay. us some stuff? Sure. Um, let me... Let's get you, are Wait, you ready? One sec. No. She's typing on her secret <laughs> password. Now I know what it is. Uh, cool. That's you, okay. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so we'll, I'll, I'll do the, the flow that we looked at yesterday together. Um, there's some sky swapping in here too. I think it's just such a fun thing to demo for yep. changing lighting in an image. Um, yeah, went to Iceland recently. We did this really cool spot called the Blue Lagoon. Um, but I then went to a wedding at the Bronx Zoo and I saw, I saw these seals who were posing. It was too fun to pass up. So I'm gonna do a little uh, geographically inaccurate Photoshop and bring the seal into the spa with me. Uh, Oh, climate change. I know. <laughs> Who knows? They might be in Iceland as we speak. Yeah, so I, I like to get started with quick select. Honestly, in something like this, I'm not even sure what select subject would come up with naturally. But like Terry was saying, you have these options for when you do the work. I like to do the work a little bit more on the selection side just because. Yeah, it's, it's much better if you do it here as yeah, opposed to trying to fix the mask. You can get kind of a, just a finer, a finer grain. Control. And now that I've been practicing for this demo so much, I definitely have um, better motor control than I did at the start. <laughs> yeah, so after you make your initial selection, I will say, I feel like selections intimidated me for a long time on the desktop. I'm more of like a, an internet meme Photoshop <laughs> expert than, a, you know, like an influencer. And so it's been really cool to be on this team and just get really comfortable with these super powerful concepts because if you're used to using these destructive tools that have been around for so long, like getting comfortable with masking, really seeing that mask like as pixels to be manipulated. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's really fun. And then, yeah, because we're still working on bringing refine edge, you know, for things like shift edge and stuff, I will sometimes just cheat a little and use blur in combination with, oops, opacity and softness here. Yeah, so Terry pointed out like scrubbing, scrubbing here in the header. Um, like our ethos when it comes to designing for mobile is just like everything, you just want everything to be accessible with a gesture. So I didn't call it out in the keynote yesterday, but like I, I never tap this and then move the slider. I will always just start scrubbing right on the number, um, just because I think it's it's so much faster. I did not know. That. <laughs> and honestly, I mean, when it comes to like I this, I did call in the demo, but it's 
you have the choice, and this is brush by brush of what your settings are. So you know you don't have to use pressure for size. You can choose to use it for something like opacity. So this you know might be a case where I want my pressure to yeah you know I'll use that later. <laughs> I'll find a better example for that. Um, but yeah, as you're going about your work for different tasks, I've definitely found those different settings to be, to be crucial. Okay. There we go. So let's position this guy a little better on here. Okay. So obviously now he's a little out of, out of place in the image. Let's do a clipped adjustment layer and kind of bring that hue set a little more in line. And I'm not actually going to worry about getting this too perfect right now because I have bigger, I have bigger plans for what happens in this image. Um, cool. So we'll leave that there for right now. Now I'm going to do uh, the sky swap. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't wait. <laughs> and yeah, I always start, like I said, with quick select. But it, it's also, so quick select is not a perfect algorithm, obviously. Like it is going mostly by color. Um, oh, and here's a good place to sort of just be toggling with subtracting and, and adding. Uh, so that's holding down that touch holding modifier. Holding down that touch modifier, yeah. And just kind of like getting it where I want it. Yeah, this is something that I would never do on the desktop with a mouse because I just feel like this is hard. <laughs> um, but the iPad has turned me into a real like selection maven. Okay, cool. So this is where we're going to invert. Um, and mask this layer. Cool. And let's bring in, so when I was in Iceland, the whole point of the trip for me was to see the Northern Lights. And I made my friend go with me on this like uh, midnight uh, bus ride out into the middle of nowhere where there turned out to be like 500 other people also <laughs> waiting to see the Northern Lights. and. We actually saw them, so I'm going to celebrate that here. I definitely feel like I earned it because you're not supposed to take flash photography of the Northern Lights. No. Why would you try to do that, right? <laughs> um, but some people are trying it. Luckily, one professional was there, shared his photos with me. Um, okay, I'm actually just going to blur this a little bit more because I sized it up, so I lost a little of that fidelity. And this gives me another great opportunity to sort of create that fake depth of field I did yesterday. So before I adjust the colors in the image, I'll actually work on that. First things first. OK, so here I'm actually just going to start by getting just the parts of this foreground that I want. And then let me make sure I do this right. I want to. Let's try to subtract the mask. No. Add the mask. Add mask. I wanted to do something fancy here for you guys. OK, no. Oh, I know. Invert the selection. Add the mask. <laughs> this is where being like a little bit dyslexic is coming into play. That's OK. Invert. Basically, I'm just going to copy this layer and paste it here and then load the mask as a selection invert it okay and then just control T Oops. and then go to that add a mask there we go okay some complicated math you could probably do it better yourself <laughs> Uh, but here I'm just going to sort of create, cancel. Oh, I see what I did. Sorry about this. Okay. Invert. Oops. Target that. Invert. Okay, great. Got it right where I want it. Sometimes these things can take me a second just to like figure out where I am. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna, 
Actually, before I do this, I'm going to load this as a selection. And oh, this is the one where I, yeah. Let's load the selection. I'm gonna add this back in. Subtracting. All right. Okay. <laughs> you're seeing it. You're seeing it happen live. Great. Now I have what I need. Okay. So here I'm going to blur this a little bit. Cancel. So you're just creating different layers. Yeah. Of the here I'm just I'm just basically masking out. And Terry, you can step in at any point here. Okay. So I also want to hide that in the layer behind because I'm going to create this fake depth of field effect. Deselect. Okay. So now I should have this isolated in. Yeah. Awesome. That's right where I want it. And I'll just blur it a little bit here. Okay. So now this is where you see this kind of painful process of experimentation getting here, but this is where using masks is really nice because I haven't eliminated any pixels, so I can go back and smooth out a lot of those mistakes. So if you're someone in the room who's like, I don't know, I just want to like, I just want to like copy and paste and make a bunch of layers, and then, <laughs> um, I've had to really weed myself off that practice because this, it ends up being so much easier. I can go back in and, you know, smooth out right here where I didn't get a perfect edge. I can really take full advantage of um, those pixels that are still waiting for me there. Cool. And then I'm just going to go and whoop, here again, I'll blur that mask a little bit. Okay. Kind of get like a haze going. Cool. Somewhere here, I still had a little line. So I'm going to, yeah, just eliminate that. Awesome. Okay, so let's bring back in our seal. Now I've got this depth of field I want. I have my seal. We can take care of that, uh, the lighting and the sort of mood that the northern lights would bring into the, the image. Um, the first thing I think I want to tackle is the color because you know, I really wanted to have this like eerie glow. And let me add, I'll add a global adjustment layer here. Reset. Mm. Actually, I'll use color balance. You know, let's tackle exposure first because I think that'll be more impactful. Obviously, you know, we're going to want to bring it down quite a bit, at least at the bottom. And here is where I really like to use gradients. I don't think I use these at all in my demo, but um, using a gradient on a mask can be really, really powerful when you're trying to get a very specific effect. Um, and we're starting with two color gradients, so it takes the foreground and background colors. Soon we'll have all that gradient power you expect with different stops and some of the stuff that Terry showed in desktop. But for now, I'm just going to take this opportunity. Really subtle. Kind of just find exactly the look I want. There we go. Okay. Bring it down. Give it this glow. Okay, and then I can actually get a. Uh, Because then I also I want, kind of want to do the same thing on the color balance layer and really just highlight that water where I had so much blue, give it that same sort of greenish tint. Okay. So this is kind of quick, but yeah, 
using this power of masking combined with adjustment layers, you know, when my friends who are really intimidated by Photoshop are like, what would you teach me if you could only teach me like a few things? I say, adjustment layers, masking, being comfortable in the layers panel, and then, you know, whatever tool it is that you use in your day-to-day -day work. Um, because when you combine those things together, and those are really some of the, the high-level concepts we've prioritized for this first version for that very reason, especially when you're round tripping back and forth between desktop and the iPad. Um, really working non-destructively in that way can save you a lot of time and headache because you know you've got those original pixels to go back to. You can, you can always sort of step back from some of the changes you've made. Uh, without bloating your files to be really big because like I used to do, you have like a group and then you copy it three times because you want to make a change, you're not totally sure. Um, yeah, so that's that's a, just a quick walkthrough of like one, one flow I do. All right. So uh, I asked you this yesterday, I think it was a hidden feature um, because you were surprised that there was, it wasn't documented in the keyboard shortcuts. Oh, yeah. The... So you might remember when she was uh, showing the sneak of, um, uh, what was it? There was a um, select subject yeah. uh, on the turtle. She was able to show you that selection like with a red overlay. And I, I know that's quick mask on the desktop, but how did you get to that on, on iPad? Yeah, so it wasn't full quick mask mode, but you know, let's just make a selection here to take a look. Um, it's just there. Are, I didn't. <laughs> this is another thing I, you know, I've learned working on Photoshop is how many different ways you have to view your selections. Obviously, these marching ants are like iconic, um, but it de totally depends on what you're doing and, and what you're trying to see. Pressing F. Uh, lets you cycle through all the different ways you have to view your selections in Photoshop. So we have this sort of rubyless red overlay. Um, this view where the background is darkened and the selection is highlighted. Kind of this view where you're using light. And if, you, yeah, if, you, if you're new to masks, I really recommend cycling through these until you find one that is intu or new to selections and masking. Like cycle through these until you find the one that's intuitive to you because it can be, yeah, depending on how your mind works it, <laughs> or the task at hand. Um, yeah, like if I, w the, we used the red for the refine edge demo because it shows really well. But if I were actually doing that type of like refine edge work with that boy, I would use, I would actually use like a dark background because for me, it's just easier to see that dark hair coming off a dark background like it's a subtle change. All right. Some people might prefer the light. Cool. All right, I've got one uh, on a topic we talked about. So one of the things that um, w right now Photoshop on the iPad is primarily targeted at compositing, correct? Yeah. I do more retouching than I do compositing. And I know that there are tools that are coming that will you know, come over from Photoshop that will help with the retouching part. But I thought a happy medium might be for now Photo restoration. Yes. I know you've got an example. Yeah. I've got an example. Oh, I like yours. Yeah. Let, me, let me get to mine, because mine's quick and easy. So let me do mine first, and then you can show um, the one that you have. I think you had a cool one. Cool. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to switch over back to me. Oh, hang on. It's probably the desktop. Switch to the iPad. There we go. So I, um, this is a stock photo. I don't know these people. <laughs> this is a stock photo. And it just, I looked for things that were old, cracked, damaged photo in my search and got a bunch of these to come up with. Um, now, my go-to tools in the desktop would be uh, healing brush, patch, uh, clone stamp, of course, cropping and fixing the color, that, that goes without saying, but just fixing the damage is what I'm aiming at right now. And I've got a couple of those, not all of them, but I've got a couple to start with. So let me go ahead and grab my uh, Apple Pencil here. And there is a spot healing brush, and there is a clone stamp tool. So you can use either one. So just the spot healing brush works like it always did. I think I'm gonna, make my, I'm gonna try your tip now to make, oh, look at that, that does work to make the brush bigger. Holding out on me. <laughs> It's okay. I 
still want a bigger brush. And you got to be careful when you come in on someone's face because the background people will forgive, someone's face they will not forgive. Now, of course, this is just rinse and repeat. Just keep going through it with your healing brush until you've got all the little areas repaired. But in case where like there's a little blue speck of something on the on her cheek there, um, and I could heal that out, but just to show you how the other tool would work, if I did switch over to the clone stamp tool, uh, as you know on the desktop, you have to pick a source first. That would be an option or an alt key, click somewhere else and then and do it. Who can guess what you would hold down on iPad? Touch modifier, touch modifier exactly. <laughs> so touch modifier, select set your source, tap and then you are cloning. And that was a bad clone, so let's do it again. Let's pick a darker source. There we go. Still not great, too much pressure. There we go. And then up here, it was way brighter than I expected it to be. And then to smooth that out, that's when I usually use patch, but we'll switch back to the healing brush for now. And just smooth that out. Now when you have a, like part of the photo is completely gone, like torn away, gone, burned out, whatever, then that would, oh, <laughs> that's bad. That would take a lot more work with various tools like the clone stamp tool to kind of restore or copy from another part of the photo to make that work. Something going on down here. There's just a lot of stuff that's missing. So this would might be another clone stamp opportunity. Smaller brush. Softer brush. It's as soft as it gets. So yeah, once I do a repair, then I typically want to blend it, blend it in because sometimes that repair can look obvious and very hard edged. All right. So again, this would just be continuing to remove all the tears and broken things in the photo. Once that would be all done, then we can go in and crop it. Don't really need the border. And then at that point, this is where you might go in with a black and white adjustment. And dial in the black and white that you're looking for.
Okay, and um, Emily, you've got one? Yeah. Layers. Hold on one second. Back down to that area. All right. I'll switch over to you, and I'm going to keep working. All right, let's see oh. yours. So, <laughs> as I was looking through some old photos my parents had sent me, um, I found this one of my grandmother and her brother, which looks like it's from... You know, it's from a scrapbook, like the 30s probably. Definitely like an OG attempt at a Photoshop using collage. Um, so I thought, you know, this would be a fun one to kind of just like finish the job. Maybe use a little clone stamp, make it look like they're actually standing in front of the Statue of Liberty. So here, let's start, we can start by cleaning up a little bit. Using, just getting rid of some of that. Some of this little dust and scratches. And then let's get into the real work. So I haven't, I really haven't tested this one, so we're going to see how far quick select can get us. Yeah, even when I'm doing clone stamps, sometimes I like to start with a selection to kind of protect whatever it is I'm, whatever it is I'm not trying to clone. There. Um, yeah, so something I didn't talk about yesterday, because I didn't make the mistake that would have required me to talk about it, um, is the gestures we have around, there's so many ways to undo and redo. Um, you know, you can use Command Z, uh, you can use those buttons uh, on the top of the screen here. You can also do like a, a double tap to undo and a triple tap to redo. So kind of a, it's kind of a risky business to be tapping when you're also selecting, but that's just sometimes what I do. Okay, let me grab that. Cool, so now I just have sort of a protective barrier while I do some cloning over here. And I just want to bring, yeah, make sure. Here, I have some of those options I want um, for the clone stamp tool. I'm not going to use them here because I only have one layer and I am doing this destructively. I guess I could, I could do best practice and add a second layer. <laughs> but um, yeah, just so you know, they're there. And you have some of these same like size and opacity controls, which can really come in handy. through. Yeah, and again, you can see how starting with that, I love clone stamp for stuff like this because you really can, anywhere where you're trying to like bring a texture across an image, especially using that opacity, it just lets you get some of that natural variety that just copying and pasting and masking might not. Very cool. Okay, we're almost out of time, and I promised you we would have time for questions. So I'm going to let Emily keep working, but we're going to answer your questions yeah. while you ask them. All right, first one right here. You mentioned uh, F to move through the selection view modes. What is the, if you don't have a keyboard, how you can you? Very good question. No, you cannot right now. <laughs> um, so there are... Yeah, there are just some things that right now are sort of Easter eggs that are only accessible through the keyboard or only accessible through the touch shortcut. I mentioned the technical limitations around those. Um, By the way, that's how far I got that quickly. <laughs> oh, cool. OK, next. Yes, ma'am. Can you copy and paste? Yeah. Control C, Control V. From the keyboard, same thing. Without the keyboard. Oh, without the keyboard? It's under this um, ellipsis Oh, menu. hang on. They're not seeing you. There we go. Show me again. So, yeah. I can cut. I can paste. 
Uh, here in the, so this is sort of, we call like the task bar. So this is where you're taking those actions on your layers or uh, other sort of selections. And that's where, like Terry said, a lot of that stuff that would be under a file menu is located right now. Um, and that's a, that's a good question, actually. I'm not totally sure why that verbiage is there that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I just did it. So I just, here, I'll switch back to me. I just copied some of her code, moved it around. So that, all I did was make a selection, hit that copy layer, and paste, and I got that. And if I'm not mistaken, it's because it's, it is, even though it was just a selection, it's not copying the whole layer, so it's, only, it's, like, um, it's like the command in, in Photoshop that's layer via copy. So it's doing it in two steps. You're making a selection, you're doing a copy, and when you paste, it's pasting it onto a new layer. So it automatically did that when I when I did it, when I copied her uh, jacket. So let me do it again. Selection, menu, copy layer, deselect, and just paste. Oh, oh hang on, I'm still in selection. There we go. Now she has that, yes. Uh, what about shapes? Would that be included eventually? Shapes? Yeah. Shape layers, shapes. Yeah, it's on our, our product roadmap. Everything's on the roadmap. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so a matter and, of when. And there is, on the home screen, you know, there are uh, very prominent panels saying, like, request a feature in Photoshop. Really use, use those. Um, yeah, right here on the upper right, suggest a feature. Suggest what's next. So, because yeah. here's the thing. The team would love to bring it all over, yeah. <laughs> but, and they will work to bring over as much as they can that makes sense. But the question then becomes, in what priority? Yeah. And that's where you come in. That's, and that's one reason. Set the priority. This is, this is a V1, and it was really time to get it into the community's hands so that we could start working not just with a select group of, you know, we're doing all this research all the time, but it's important to see what's, what is the priority for the most people, so we can get that in there the fastest. Yeah. And my priority. Tell your friends yeah. to, to also request shapes. My priorities are not, like, shapes will never even be on my priority list. Yeah. So that's why you got to put yours in. Yeah. Yes. So what about, are there plans to show brush edges whenever you're done? Like, when I'm painting a mask, I don't know where my brush edges are until I've gone past where I want to be. So showing brush edges when you're painting? I, I see what you're saying. The yeah, you because you're working with a mouse, you have that you have that placeholder for yeah, the brush. Like the size that your brush is, so you know where that is to start. Yeah. Yeah, you don't unfortunately with a touch UI, like with a mouse, the minute you select the brush, you see it on the screen. And you and then you press the button, you start moving around. With a with a stylus there's no contact until you actually touch the screen. But in that case, and to his point, I think there should be, even though I'm touching the screen, I'm not seeing the circle. So I'm not seeing the boundary of what that, the size of that brush and where it's going. So I think we could do that. Yeah, that could. Right, yeah, because you don't see, you don't even see the circle, so even while you're painting. If you, yeah. It, if you adjust the um, size of the brush, oh. right now the closest thing we have to this is that as you adjust the size of the brush, yeah, you, you see you it. Get you that see preview. that but first. I, I totally understand. But then it goes away, and when you start painting, you don't see it. Yeah, yeah I and agree. The, yeah, the thinking is kind of like when you're using a mouse that is just your proxy for where you're going to be enacting that stroke. So in a touch UI, in one sense, like you know where it's gonna happen because you're touching the screen. But yeah, there those kinds of overlays, making sure that there are settings and options for people to bring those in. 
I definitely see your point, but suggest that as a feature as well. Yes, over here. Yep. Ooh, like normally I'd hit D for the default colors. I don't think there. No, I don't think there's a non-keyboard shortcut. Right? That's okay. a good question. And D does work. Yeah. It's and and some of that stuff. We're work. You know. Long term, don't want to. Uh, require that people have a keyboard to access all this functionality. Good um, question. But, I love that. Yeah. If, I had, most, if I had a prize, I'd give it to you. That was a good one. St yes. Yeah. Statistically speaking, most people who have iPad Pros do have the keyboard and that. No, but you shouldn't. But absolutely. You shouldn't need the yeah. keyboard to default your colors right. back to black. It's one of those things. V1. How to get out of there. Yes. Yes. So the question was, can I merge layers? So for example, I turn off her hat layer. <laughs> no, that's the, the hat layer here. Oh, wrong. oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Undo, undo, undo. Go back to that one, turn it back on. And now that layer is selected, there is a merge down and merge visible at the very bottom. Yep. Here. Not yet. No alignments, no guides, no rulers. You know, some of this is under the headline of hidden features. If you bring in um, a file that has guides on the desktop, they won't be visible to you yet, but you can like snap to them. So if you're doing intricate work with guides, it's something to be aware of for sure, so it doesn't surprise me. I almost count, count that as a bug. I know. <laughs> right, but anyway, because you can't like, see the them. The guides are coming soon. <laughs> All right, anything else? If I can't see your hand, just go ahead and yell it out. Go ahead. Not yet. Are smart objects supported yet was the question. Not yet. They, if you open a file that has them. Yeah. Like, no, By the way, yeah. any file you open, if like if you if you create a bunch of smart objects, a bunch of things that even aren't supported yet on the desktop, and open that file, they're still there. There's just no UI to manipulate them yeah. on the iPad yet. So you don't lose them. You, you just can't. Still, you know, you could mask. Create yeah, them. You could right. mask a smart object. Right. You could clip something to a smart object. You, but you just can't go in and edit the smart object, which right. is obviously a limitation that we're working on. Well, that is our time. We're actually over. I want to thank you guys for being here this morning. <laughs>